Hello, I'm Bill Kirkland. I'd like to welcome you to this online version of HCC's worship experience. I don't know when you're, you'll be watching this, whether it's Sunday or sometime later in the week. I do want to point out that this Sunday is Valentine's Day, and so it correlates very well with Pastor Dan's uh, series message, uh, Staying in Love. And I don't think it's probably a coincidence that he had planned that. I bet he'd been planning that for a long time. And I want to thank Pastor Dan for giving us these um, insights into Scripture through his messages. Um, I also want to welcome back, welcome, uh, back the people who are meeting in person. This would be the second Sunday of in-person services at HCC. I want to thank all the people who come who continue to uh, be safe through wearing masks, through physical distancing, and it's through those efforts that we will be able to navigate through this pandemic, and we appreciate those efforts. I also want to point out that next Sunday, that would be February 21st, the small groups will be meeting, and that's at 9 a.m. on February 21st. I want to thank all those who contributed the uh, soup donations for last week's Super Bowl Sunday, those will be used for the blessing box, which is the uh, little uh, supply depot out in the parking lot, and also as donations for the inner church food pantry. I want to thank you for your contributions. And concerning the uh, Super Bowl Sunday, Linda Moore made these nice pennants. So if you want to show your HCC spirit, you can pick one of these up in the church office. And speaking of Valentine's Day, I know it's mostly um, associated with romantic love, but since not everyone has a sweetheart, uh, I think we can celebrate more broadly uh, as a church by, well, I just want to suggest that we tell people we love them today. Uh, they could be friends, our brothers and sisters, our children, our grandchildren, and our parents. If, even if your parents are no longer living, send up a little prayer just to let them know that you love them and appreciate how they cared for you. And I think that we'll all feel good if we do that. It might be a surprise to someone you tell, and it also might be just what someone needs to hear. And I hope that someone tells you today that they love you. Let's begin this worship experience with a prayer. Dear Lord and God, we praise you in this moment of worship, meditating on love due to our pastor's message and also because this particular day is so associated with love. We are overwhelmed by your love for us, that you loved us before we knew and loved you, that you desire to be with that you desire us to be with you so much that you prepared a way for us to spend eternity with you, even though we are unworthy of that on our own. Dear Lord, help us that we may, that, that all we feel for the great love you have for us and convict us and inspire us to love others as you have loved others. Help us to love not necessarily expecting love in return, but simply because you command us to love one another. Teach us, Lord, daily to conform our will to serving you in all we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Do you remember what it felt like to fall in love? What happens to those feelings? Falling in love comes naturally, but staying in love requires a plan. While many couples just endure their marriages, fortunately, there is a blueprint for maintaining and even growing those feelings over time. Well, if you're watching this on the original broadcast day, happy Valentine's Day. If you're watching sometime after, um, happy belated Valentine's Day if you missed it. Um, but did you know that though Valentine's Day is celebrated all across the world, it is not an actual official holiday in any country? The story of the origin of Valentine's Day is a little bit shrouded in mystery. It, it's connected with a bunch of different saints and patrons and things like that. So there's, there's still some confusion about how it all really started. But one thing that we do know is that Pope Galatius I established a feast in the 5th century to honor St. Valentine, who was martyred on February 14th, 269 A.D., for aiding followers of Jesus who were being persecuted under the Roman Empire. It was in the 14th and 15th century BC when Valentine's Day became connected to romantic relationships, apparently associated with the arrival of the lovebirds in early spring. And it was in the 18th century in England when people began exchanging flowers and cards and candies and chocolates and all that as an expression of affection to someone. Now, let's jump back to this lovebird thing because it's pretty interesting. The lovebirds is a common name given to a group of parrots located primarily on the continent of Africa. And they are called lovebirds because they are affectionate and relational and they pair together for life, and they are able to spend long amounts of time together. So Valentine's Day has become a holiday where we express affection to someone in the hopes that that affection is mutual, and the two of us expressing affection for one another may potentially be able to become lovebirds people who are affectionate and relational, people who will potentially pair together for life and be able to sit together for long periods of time. But as we think about this, we may wonder whether it's really possible. Is it possible to become lovebirds, to stay affectionate for the long haul, to pair together for a lifetime, and to be able to sit together for long periods of time in relationship with someone? Is, in other words, is, is it possible to fall in love and stay in love? Is it possible to have relationships that sustain for the long haul? Jesus spoke into this idea as we discovered in part one of the Staying in Love series. Jesus said to his followers and to people like us that if we want to sustain relationships for the long haul, there's something that we need to do. And he said, we need to love one another. Jesus said that we take this idea of love and we make it a verb. We take the idea of love and it's beyond just a feeling and it's beyond just words, it's action. It's what we do in the relationship that demonstrates love for one another. <clears throat> and then Jesus went just a little bit further and gave an example of what it looks like to love one another. He said, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. There are all sorts of cues around us that we can take relationship counsel and try to glean relationship wisdom from there are cues in the culture around us 
And there are cues in the relationships we see around us. And there are cues from relationships we've been in uh, and a part of in, in our, in previously. But if we take our cues from the culture and the relationships around us and even the relationships that we've experienced, there is a likelihood that they will not lead us to God-honoring healthy relationships. If we want relationships that will sustain for the long haul, we need to follow the example of Jesus to love as he loved us. The early church leader Paul, in a, rela- in a, in a letter to the church at Philippi, takes this idea that Jesus spoke about of loving one another as he loved us and, and kind of clarifies what that requires and what that looks like and how that's played out in relationships and how that leads to sustaining relationships for the long haul. So, here's what Paul wrote about sustaining relationships for the long haul. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. The, the word nothing literally means no thing. So do nothing, do no thing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Those things should have no part in our relationships with one another. Selfish ambition shouldn't have a part in our relationships. Vain conceit shouldn't have a part in our relationships. Selfish ambition can oftentimes carry with it the idea of competitiveness and sometimes sometimes we can make our relationships a little bit of a competition we we we, we've even been known to keep score on the number of times that i empty the dishwasher or i take out the trash or i do something in the relationship and if i'm able to score more points than the other person then that makes me better in the relationship. Or at least it makes me feel better in the relationship. Or at least that's what vain conceit wants me to think in the relationship. Selfishness and vain conceit and competition, if we want relationships that sustain for the long haul, are not consistent with the example of Jesus. If we want to love as Jesus loved, those things should have no place in our relationships with one another. But Paul, as if that's not enough to wonder whether or not we're capable of doing this, Paul Paul goes a little bit further on this blueprint that he gives for sustaining relationships for the long haul. He says, rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Now notice what the verb in this phrase is. The verb is the word value. So if value is a verb, what what does it mean to value others above yourselves? Valuing others above yourself literally means to act and believe as if he or she is above you is better than you, is more important than you. Now, this isn't about declaring anyone with more intrinsic value than someone else. Because we are all created in the image of God. And we all have immense value as image bearers of God. Even if you're someone who's disconnected from God, you have immense value because you are created in the image of God. If if you've been a follower of Jesus for a long time, you are created in the image of God and you have immense value. So this isn't about intrinsic value. This is about how and where we place ourselves and others in relationship with one another. Have you ever sat at a table in a reception hall when the bride and groom entered the room? In that moment when the bride and groom entered the room, you recognized something. You recognized that you were not the most important person in the room. You acknowledged and placed yourself in the appropriate position that they were the most important people in the room. 
You, you, did you notice that when they were greeting people in the reception line, no, no one was really lined up to greet you? Did, did you notice that when it came time to dismiss the tables for the food line, that they went first? They did that because they were the most important people in the room. And, and you made a decision to place yourself as not the most important person in the room. You made a decision to not jump ahead of them in the food line. You made a decision to not stand in between them in the greeting line so that you could be greeted along with them. And in our relationships with one another, valuing others above ourselves is this kind of approach of putting ourselves and others in the appropriate place and the appropriate position in relationship with one another. And as if that's not enough to make us wonder whether we can actually do this or not, Paul continues to give more information about this blueprint. He says, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interests of others. Now, I may be the only one, but if I'm honest, which I try to be, I'm interested in the things that interest me. And if we take that a little further, I'm interested in the things that interest me, and I'm not interested in the things that oh, don't interest me. Left to myself, I drift toward the things that are of interest to me. And in a relationship with one another, when I am not interested in what someone else is interested in, it's easy for there to become a disconnect in the relationship due to a lack of interest. But when we value others above ourselves, we are willing to look not only to our own interests, but to the interests of others. We're willing to be interested in what the person that we want to love as Jesus loved us cares about. And it, it, it's not just an empty, false, superficial kind of interest. It's, it's taking a genuine, heartfelt interest in what matters to them. And we put action behind this. We, we start and participate in a fantasy football league because someone in our family is interested in fantasy football. We, we watch Hallmark Christmas movies because someone in our family is interested in Hallmark Christmas movies. And you're able to find a way to enjoy the fantasy football league. And you're actually able to find a way to enjoy the Hallmark Christmas movie that has the same plot for the 700th time because you genuinely care about what the other person is interested in. Paul then goes next to the type of attitude, the type of mindset that we have to have to be able to do this, to build and establish and develop relationships that can be sustained for the long haul. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Just as Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. We have to have the same attitude that Jesus had about relationship with one another. And there are all sorts of attitudes around us. There are attitudes about relationship in the culture around us. And if we embrace those attitudes, they likely will not lead to long-term, healthy, God-honoring relationships. And there are attitudes in the relationships that we see around us. And if we embrace those, they are likely to not lead to long-term, healthy, God-honoring relationships. But when we take the attitude of Jesus, it changes everything in our approach to relationships with one another. 
So, what is this mindset that Jesus had? It says, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. We tend to approach relationships more like a 50-50 proposition. If we do something in the relationship for the benefit of the other, we expect that at some point, in some way, that's going to come back to us in some form of a benefit. If we do something helpful, we expect there to be credit earned in our account. But Jesus, being in very nature God, did not ever leverage I'm God for his own benefit. There are plenty of instances where Jesus leveraged I'm God for the advantage and benefit of others. But not one time did he leverage I'm God to his own advantage. And when we take the approach of Jesus into our relationships, we don't leverage our position or privilege or status or power or anything to our own advantage. We leverage all of that for the advantage of others. And so Jesus, or I'm sorry, Paul continues down this path of a blueprint for right relationships or with, with one another. <clears throat> he says, rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Remember what the word nothing means. It means no thing. And Jesus, being in very nature God, made himself no thing. Uh, one of the other translations says that he emptied himself. He took his position and privilege and rights as God and emptied himself of those things for the benefit of relationship with people like me and people like you. We're used to seeing people who are full of themselves. But the path to staying in love, the path to relationships that will be sustained for the long haul is emptying ourselves like Jesus emptied, our, emptied himself because we see others with immense value. Paul goes on to give us more of this Jesus mindset and action that he put to it. It says, in being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, if you've been around for any length of time, um, you, you, you've probably seen or would be familiar that we've used this passage in the context of humility. And we're used to seeing people get humbled rather than express being humble. And we can even, in certain circumstances, take a certain level of joy when someone gets humbled. You know, we, we tend to like it when someone gets what we think they have coming to them. But what Paul says here about Jesus is that he humbled himself. And how did he do this? Paul says, by. By. How, how did Jesus do this? Did did. did did he take out the garbage without being asked? Did, did he empty the dishwasher without being asked? Did he actually make eye contact and pay attention in the conversation? Did, 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 did he stay within budget to lower the level of tension and stress in the relationship? Paul says Jesus did even more than those things. As good and helpful as those things are, Jesus did more. He says he became obedient to death. Jesus died for us. 
Jesus died to redeem us from sin that had broken relationship with God and to provide the path to right relationship with God. Jesus set aside his rights for relationship with us. <clears throat> Jesus faced quite a dilemma. He, he could have kept his rights. He could have kept his privilege. He could have kept his position and status. And in doing so, left the relationship between God and humankind broken. Or, he could have humbled himself and became obedient to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. It couldn't be both ways. When Jesus humbled himself, and died to redeem us from sin and restore the path to right relationship with God, he placed our greatest need above himself. He saw us with intrinsic and immense value and was willing to go to great lengths to demonstrate how much we were valued. In relationship with one another, we cannot have it both ways. We can maintain our rights, our status, our privilege, our position, or we can humble ourselves and give up our rights for relationship with someone else without question there are times where we have to take a stand for what is right there are times where we have to take a stand for ourselves and sometimes sometimes there are even relationships that we need to establish a separation in for our own well-being but we do not have to spend all of our relationships making a point and never making a difference. Jesus humbled himself and gave of himself out of a concern for my interest and your interest out of his great love for us. In relationship with one another, have the same mindset of Jesus. Take the same attitude and love as Jesus loved. That's the blueprint for relationships that last for the long haul. That's the blueprint for staying in love. It's easy to fall in love. Falling in love requires a pulse. Staying in love requires a plan. Let me pray for you as we wrap up this time together. Dear God, thank you for the attitude and the mindset of Jesus. And thank you that Jesus was willing to put action behind the mindset to love us and to give us an example for how we can love others. And God, I pray for anyone right now who's in a relationship where it seems like love can't be sustained for the long haul. I pray that if there's an attitude within them or the other person that needs to be adjusted to more align with the attitude of Jesus, that they will be able to identify that and take the steps needed to align. If there's someone who isn't in a relationship but desires that relationship, because God, did the desire to love and be loved is your thumbprint upon us. I pray that as they position themselves and prepare themselves for that type of relationship for the long haul, that they will discover and embrace 
and implement the attitude and the mindset of Jesus. God, I pray for each and every one of us that as much as we desire to be connected in relationship with one another, that we will desire to be connected in relationship with you, that we will embrace what Jesus did for us that we could never do for ourselves when he placed my greatest need above his rights and responsibility and privilege. Thank you that he took the responsibility to redeem my sin and to restore relationship with you. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for choosing to connect with the online campus of Hurricane Community Church. If this is your first time, I hope it wasn't your last time. But I do hope that this time helped you take a step in relationship with God and as a follower of Jesus. And I hope you'll connect with us again next time for part three of Staying in Love. How's your heart? No, seriously. How is your heart? <laughs>